Um, but tonight in the book of Colossians, uh, chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. The book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. And to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Verse number 10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, bring fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now I want you to... What I want you to do tonight, I was this morning too for some reason, what I want you to do is to make a connection here when I read these verses again. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will, the knowledge of his will, underline in your mind tonight his will, in all wisdom, underline in your mind tonight wisdom, God's will, and wisdom. Make the connection and spiritual understanding that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. So tonight is kind of in your mind underline those three things. God's will, God's wisdom equals being fruitful. God's will and God's wisdom equals being fruitful. Now the Apostle Paul is saying here that he's praying without ceasing and he's praying for them that they have a, a knowledge of God's will. And he's also praying for them to have wisdom and spiritual understanding for the reason and the purpose that they will bear fruit and be fruitful in all that they do. So apparently there's a real connection there. And I want to kind of break that down tonight a little bit about knowing God's will, having God's wisdom, and being fruitful. Knowing God's will, having God's wisdom, and being fruitful. So you're going to hear me say those things tonight quite a bit. We understand that wisdom, the, where wisdom begins is knowing God's will. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 17 says, Wherefore be you not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And uh, before we talk about the will of God here a little bit, I just want to kind of go over a couple of things to help us prepare our hearts for this. You know, I, I shared with this before. And it used to be, before I was born again, before I was a Christian, um, even in my wildest of days, any time I was faced with a decision, I for some reason would go to my grandparents. Now my grandparents at that time were the only Christians that I really knew in my life or that I had much contact with. But I would go to them and I would lay down before them maybe the, the situation I was facing and the, the battle maybe I was in, the decision I was trying to make quite often. I would lay that out before them and they would give me their answer and I knew that when I heard their answer, I had the right answer. I mean, I just knew they would give me the right answer. Now, I left there and probably didn't do it. But I knew I had heard the right answer. I knew I had went to them, they had told it to me. I knew then what was right. And then I went out most of the time and did what I wanted to do anyway. Now, you might ask the question, did I really hear them? But I would say in a biblical sense, I didn't hear them. It's kind of like I'll have people come to me and, and they'll want to have a, you know, ask the pastor a question. And, you know, one of the classic examples is you've got maybe a, a young man or a young lady and they've met each other and they're falling in love and they come to you and say, Pastor, do you think I should marry so-and-so? And a lot of times I'll say, well, you know, uh, you know, according to the Word of God, uh, you're not supposed to be yoked to a non-Christian, so probably you shouldn't marry so-and-so. And they go off and they marry so-and-so. In other words, they already had their mind made up, maybe, and when they came and asked my advice, I could give them the Word of God to show them what my advice was based upon the Word of God, but they really were in a mindset or in a state of their heart that they truly were willing to do the advice they were given. You know, there's a lot of times like that. I can remember years when I, years when I worked at Faith, Hope, and Love, and it was a halfway house, and a lot of the people there, maybe, who were in trouble were mandated to go to drug treatment. Mandated to go to alcohol treatment. In other words, the judge told them, you know, you're going to go to this treatment facility. You're going to be there for so many months. When you come out, you're going to do so much follow-up. And they never had any desire whatsoever to quit drugs. They never had any desire whatsoever to quit drinking. But because the court told them they had to go to that treatment, they were going to go to, to it just so they could stay out of jail. Now, how many of you think that that was really fruitful? In other words, before you have something's going to help you, before you have to be in a place that you desire to do it. And a lot of times when we're seeking God, 
God's will, the reason we're struggling so much is maybe we're not really in a place that we would do as well if he revealed it to us. Maybe we're just going to him like I did to my grandparents. I just want to hear the right answer. I'm going to do what I want to do. I've already got my mind made up what I'm going to do. But I just want to you know, go to the motions and hear the right answer. Or like the person who goes to the pastor and says, you know, pastor, what, what do you think? What's your advice on this? And, and really they're not in a mindset to really hear what you tell them. They've already got their mind made up what they want to do. But they just kind of go into the motions because it makes them feel better. You see, we have to come to the Lord and, 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 and God, I want to know your will. But we have to come with a heart that's prepared to do that will. As a matter of fact, Jesus said that if we are willing to do his will... We'll know the doctrine. We'll know the truth. And I, and I can look to the scriptures. And, and one of the examples that always came to my mind was the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul, there was a time that he was going to get to Asia to preach the gospel. And God said, no. God closed that door and said the Holy Ghost forbid him to go there at that time. And then right about that same time, he had a dream. And there appeared in his dream a Macedonian who was crying out, you know, come help us, come help us, come help us. And so Paul immediately responded to that and went into Macedonia and preached the gospel. In other words, God revealed his will to Paul at that time. And, and Paul was at a place, he was willing to instantly change course, instantly change direction, and go the direction that God wanted him to go. And so one of the first things we have to talk about people and say, Lord, I just wish I knew God's will. We have to come to a place where we're seeking God's will on a matter that when he reveals it to us that we're going to do it. Because see, I don't think God's going to give us a lot of understanding about his will if we're just going to ignore it. So one of the first things we have to ask there is, Lord, am I willing to do your will? Am I like Jesus in the garden? Not my will, Father, but yours be done in my life? Because this is where it all begins. It begins at that place of surrender when we come and we lay it down and we say, Lord, not my will, but your be done. And Father, show me your will. And that's the beginning place of bearing fruit. But you see, if our mindset is we're going to do what we want to do anyway, then we're just wasting wasted our, our time going to God and seeking His will. Why would God reveal His will to a people that don't want to do it? Why would God reveal His will to an unsurrendered vessel? It wouldn't make sense, would it? A lot of people say, I just don't know. I, you know, Pastor, I, I'm seeking God. I'm, I'm trying to understand His will. I just can't hear His will. Maybe we're not at that place of willingness. And the Lord's waiting for us to come to that place of willingness. And then when we come there, he'll speak it to us. I'm always wondering why I told my grandparents all the time, they just reach up, slap me upside the head, say, I'm going to tell you nothing, you don't ever do it anyway. But they'd always give me the answer. They'd always tell me the right thing to do. And for some reason, that gave me a certain comfort that I knew that. Even though I went out and usually did the exact opposite. So when we come to the Lord, we have to ask ourselves, Lord, is my heart in a place of surrender to you that when you reveal your will, that I will do it? And then you might say, well, how do I then know God's will? How do I find out God's will in a matter? You know, I don't think God's interested in keeping it a secret from us. And one of the examples that I use so often in we find in the scriptures, and I was speaking about it, I think, a little bit this morning even, and talking about abiding in Christ. And in Acts chapter 13, we see an example of the early church where they were gathered together, and, and, and it was prophets and teachers in this particular case. It's mentioned in the first few verses of Acts chapter 13. And it says they ministered to the Lord, and they prayed, and they fasted, and they waited upon God until the Holy Ghost said, and then the Holy Ghost said, send out Paul and Barnabas and send them out into a region to preach the gospel. But the point is, is they were seeking God. They were in worship, ministering to the Lord. They were praising God. They were praying. They were fasting. In other words, they were locked in and focused into knowing what the will of God is. What is the will of God for us? How would you like us to go? How would you like to direct us? Lord, show us where you want us to minister. Show us how you want to minister. In other words, they were locked in, surrendered to God, and willing to do what God had told them to do. So we have to ask 
yourself, am I surrendering to his will? Am I seeking his will? You know, we, we talked about this a little bit in, back in the prayer in Sunday school. That we should seek God's will and God's direction in everything in life. No matter what it is, no matter what decision we're facing, we should be surrendered to God and looking to God to make those decisions. I mean, doesn't that make sense? I mean, aren't you willing to admit at this point in life that, that God's wisdom is greater than our wisdom? That God's knowledge is greater than our knowledge? That God's understanding is greater than our understanding? And we would be foolish not to tap into that and allow Him to lead us and guide us and direct us in every area of our life? Wouldn't it be foolish not to accept that help that God offers? One of the areas that we need to understand, go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I'm just going to, like I said, try to walk you through a few scriptures tonight that have to do with, with first of all, God's will. And how do we know God's will? And there's a couple, three areas I want to share with you that are very important in understanding God's will. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And you say, what in the world does that have to do with God's will? But let me mention to you the, the meaning of a couple, three of these words. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. That's teaching. For reproof. That word reproof there means simply proof, conviction, and evidence. If you want proof of God's will, find it in the Word of God. If you want to be convinced of God's will, you find it in the Word of God. If you want evidence of God's will, you find it in the Word of God. And I tell people this all the time. Almost anything I face in life, anything challenge I face in life, almost any circumstance I face in life, I can find God's will right here in the Word. It's not a secret. God's not trying to hide it from us. God has sent his, given us his word and by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to reveal it to you and I so that we might know the will of God. And you can just about always find God's will right here in the word nearly almost all the time. Nearly almost in any circumstance, if you will go to the word of God and begin to dig in the word of God and search out the word of God, you will find God's will for whatever you're facing in life. Uh, the Bible tells us that it is for correction. Well, you say, what would he correct? One of the things he might correct us in life is the direction we're headed. We might be going this, this direction, and, and the Word of God might say, no, Mike, you're supposed to be over here going in this direction. I might be trying to, to, to do live my life a certain way, and the Word of God corrects me and says, no, that's not how you're supposed to live. Beloved, it's so much upon my heart when I was sharing this morning about the Word of God. And one of the things that I'm trying so hard to impress upon people, and, and that was, you know, like I said, we can look at God's Word in a couple different ways. And people can say, I believe the Bible's true. And they can mean, mean that from the depths of their heart, believe that every word of God's Word is true. And really what they're saying is, I believe that's a true, accurate, historical record. I believe that everything that was said in here really happened. I believe that Jesus did what it says Jesus did. I believe Jesus said what it says Jesus said. I believe that the Old Testament prophets did what the Word of God says they did. I believe that they said what they said. I believe what the, everything that is recorded here is 100% accurate, historically true. And then you can go out and live life however you want to live life and not be denying what you just said. But there's a completely different thing when you look at God's Word and say, I believe every word in this is true, and I believe this is my handbook on how to live my life. I believe this is the Word of God. This is God's book that He has given me, showing me how to live a blessed life. This is God's Word He has given me, showing me how to live a victorious life. Then I approach God's Word differently. I'm not looking at this as a history book. I'm looking at this as my guides and my direction and my instruction on how I'm supposed to live. This is God's advice given to me that showed me how life is to be lived. And, and you hear me talk about the, the parable of the two houses all the time. The one house is built upon sand. Those who hear God's Word and don't do it. The one house built upon rock, those who hear God's word and do it. Those who hear God's word and recognize this is God's handbook, this is God's guidebook, this is God's book telling me how to live my life. As opposed, this is true historically. You 
See, you can believe God's word. And believe in every word of it. In that sense of believing it's an accurate historical book, it's a nice religious book, and leave it on your bookshelf and it not have any real impact on your life. Or else you can believe, wait a second, this is God's word. This is to correct me of how I live. This is to instruct me on how I live. This is to show me the path to walk in. This is to show me God's will. This is showing me God's direction for my life. Everything that I do in life, I should look at God's word and say, what does God's word say about that? What does God's direction say about that? What does God's guidance say about that? Beyond the will of God is not a mystery. He wrote it out right here. For you and I, what's the will of God for my life? Live God's word and you'll know. I have a man tell me one time, I remember getting years ago, and I was talking, and I don't remember how it came up, but it was one of those things that, you know, I was a young in the ministry and, and really just really trying to find out God's direction in my life. And, you know, I just want to know God's will for my life. And he gave me some good advice. He says, just live God's word every day and you'll get there. That's simple, isn't it? Where does God want me in life 10 years from now? I don't know, but if you live God's word every day between now and then, you'll be there. You'll be in right God's will. You'll be in God's perfect will. Hallelujah. Y'all looking at me kind of funny. So one of the key elements for, for knowing God's will is knowing God's word. And not only knowing it in the sense that you believe it's true, but in the sense that this is my guidebook to teach me how to live my life. This is my guidebook to teach me how to walk in victory. Now the next one is really a, 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 a touchy one. People don't like this one at all. Godly counsel. Hallelujah. I don't want nobody telling me what to do. Let me talk to you for just a second. Go to the book of Proverbs. Let's look at some scriptures. And I want to talk about how we have to have this in balance. Because personally I see two extremes in this area. Proverbs chapter 11. I'm going to read to you three verses out of the book of Proverbs, and I'm going to share with you what I see as two extremes. Proverbs chapter 11. Hallelujah. Verse number 14. It says, Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Well, I don't want to fall. I want the safety side. Now let's go to Proverbs chapter 15. Yeah, stand right there. Something about that spot. Proverbs 15, verse 22. <clears throat> Without counsel, purposes are disappointed. But in the multitude of counselors, they are established. So it tells us that in a multitude of counselors, I say it. And it says here, in a multitude of counselors, the purposes of God for my life will be established. Now, let's go to Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24, verse number 6. For by wise counsel thou shalt make thy war, and in multitude of counselors there is safety. Now, obviously we know from the study of God's word, and I don't want to go into all of that tonight, but it's obviously talking about God and the counsel. And there's a couple extremes I've seen in people's lives with this. And one of the things is there are people who get into the mindset that they don't want to hear anything from anybody. And here's how you hear from that person. They come to you and they want to talk to you, or you, as a pastor, or you go to them and you want to talk to them, and you open up the Bible, and you share what the Word of God says, and you say, you know, I, I think maybe you're veering the wrong direction here, and here's what the Word of God says, and their response is, wait a second, I don't need to hear all of that. I know God's voice, and I know what God's told me. I don't need to hear from any man I've heard from God. Bingo, you're in trouble. The day you think that you don't need godly counsel, you're in trouble. The day you think that you can hear from God and what everybody else around you who's walking with the Lord, what they say they hear from God doesn't matter, you're in trouble. Y'all look at me funny, didn't I just read in the Bible that a multitude of counselors, there's safety. And where there is not no counselors, you're in trouble. 
So according to those scriptures, according to those verses, at that point in time, I need godly counsel in my life, don't I? I need godly counsel. So that person who thinks that they just can hear from God and what everybody else says doesn't matter is in trouble. And I'll be honest with you, I've seen a lot of people crash and burn that way. I've seen a lot of situations where, where people would just get in this mindset where no matter what anybody else says, it matter. I know what God wants in my life. No matter what the Word of God says, no matter what God and counsel says, I know what I'm going to do. That person's getting ready to crash and burn. Now the other extreme, the other extreme is those who want to listen to everybody. And anybody. And, and one of the things that has, has mystified me over the years as a pastor is to be in a situation where I'll see somebody in the church and, and, and there'll be somebody walk through the door and this person's life has no evidence, no fruit whatsoever of walking with God, no indications of anything godly in their life. And they just come in here and they walk up and lay hands on somebody and say, Thus saith the Lord, and they're willing to accept everything they say. And they're willing to just, you know, okay, what are you saying? Take counsel with them. And they'll come in and say, Well, so and so said I'm supposed to do this. I mean, did you notice that so and so's life is a total wreck? Why would you take advice from somebody who's a total wreck? I mean, it's like somebody coming to you and they're all cut up and skinned up and, and messed up and, and they come to you in all kinds of situations and they say, you know what? What's happening to you? Why are you all cut up and skinned up? What's going on? You say, well, I've been trying to write a Bible and I keep falling over. You say, but you know what? I'll teach you how to write. I don't want that person to teach me how to write a Bible, do you? In other words, I don't want somebody who doesn't know how to walk in the blessings of God to try to teach me how to give me godly counsel. And you say, Pastor, where are you getting all that from? Let me read to you out of the book of Hebrews. Okay, get your phone out. Right now, in the name of Jesus, and I say, get out. Book of Hebrews, chapter 6, verse number 12. Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 12. All of what I just shared with you, I'm going to show you in the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12 says that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Now what does it tell us right there? To follow who? Those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So if somebody is not walking in the promises of God, you should follow them. So if somebody's not walking in the blessings of God, then you should follow them. Why would you take godly counsel from somebody who don't know how to walk with God themselves? I say devil. That would make sense, wouldn't it? And one of the great examples that's given to us is the, is the life of Abraham. And in the life of Abraham, what we see happening is he was a man who was greatly blessed, isn't he? Turn the Bibles to book of Genesis chapter 24. Genesis 24 verse 1. Genesis chapter 24 verse 1. Book of Genesis chapter 24 verse 1. Let me show you this with Abraham. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So if the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things, then that's somebody who I want to learn how to walk with God from. Because apparently he knew how to do it. And that's exactly what Hebrews chapter 6 is talking about. One of the examples the Bible holds up to us time and time again as an example of faith is Abraham. And Abraham is an example of a man who was blessed by God. So let me ask you this. If you can follow somebody and take godly counsel from somebody, should you take godly counsel from somebody whose life is a total wreck? Or should you take godly counsel from somebody who knows how to walk with God? In other words, if we're going to take counsel from somebody, we should take counsel from somebody who knows what they're counseling us in, shouldn't we? Yeah. I mean, I don't want somebody teaching me how to ride a bike who's all skinned up and cut up from falling off the bike. <laughs> you know? I don't want somebody teaching me how to fight who gets beat up every day. Or what have you? I don't want a, somebody who's broke and don't have a penny teaching me how to manage my money. I mean, you can go on down the line, whatever it is. You don't want me to teach you how to sing. Everybody laughs at that. Why so funny about that? You must say, oh, come on, Pastor. Surely you could. Whatever. You know, if somebody is going to teach you, you want them to have some understanding of what they're teaching. 
things of God if they don't know how to walk with God. If they don't know how to live for God. If they don't know how to be blessed with God. Amen? That makes sense so far? Yes. So now, let's go to the wisdom part. Go to the book of James. Look at James. Chapter 1. Look at James chapter 1. It says, verse 5. Do you remember we looked at God's will plus wisdom equals fruitfulness? God's will plus wisdom equals fruitfulness. God's will plus wisdom equals fruitfulness. God's will plus wisdom equals fruitfulness. Hey, get it, close that door, please. God's will plus wisdom equals fruitfulness. God's will plus wisdom equals fruitfulness. So we've covered here a little bit about knowing God's will and how we know God's will. So once we know God's will, then God says, I'll give you the wisdom so you can learn how to do that will. I'll give you the wisdom to accomplish that will. You know, I mean, I was having a conversation with Rachel Day. We were talking about that when I first got called into ministry and, and first tried to walk with God. I said, you know, it was, it was very frustrating because all I had was a burden to do what I'm doing tonight, and I didn't know how to do it. I had a burden, but I didn't know where to do it. And I just knew I had this burden on my heart from God. I had this burden on my heart to do the things that I'm doing tonight. But I had no idea how you do it, where you do it, when you do it. I was total loss. See, a lot of times people get frustrated because they know the will of God. They know the purpose of God. They come to God and say, God, what's your will in this situation? They know what the situation is, and but they don't know how to accomplish it. They don't know how to see it come to pass. And God says, I'll give you wisdom. If any of you lack wisdom, and if you notice in Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, they talk about praying for a knowledge of God's will and wisdom. Know what the will of God is in your life. Know what the will of God is in a situation. Know what the will of God is in a circumstance. And at that point in time, then go to God and get the wisdom on how to bring that to pass. James chapter 1, verse number 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God to give it to all men liberally, and upbraid it not, and it shall be given him. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Now you notice there, it doesn't really qualify that. It doesn't say it has to be some supernatural, super spiritual thing. It doesn't say if you lack wisdom and how to reach people for Christ, then you ask God for that wisdom. It doesn't say if you lack wisdom and, and, you know, doing some super spiritual event, ask wisdom. But it says if you lack wisdom, you ask God. So if I lack wisdom in a situation, it might be a situation on your job. It might be a situation in your family. It might be a situation raising your kids. It might be a situation in a lot of different areas. But it says here, ask God for the wisdom to do that. And we come to the conclusion, beloved, that we need to surrender ourselves and understand what the will of God is. And then we need to be humble enough to realize, I don't know how to do this, Lord. I need your wisdom. Does that make sense? But what happens a lot of times, we seek God, we find out the will of God, and then we try to do it with our wisdom. We try to do it with our understanding. We try to do it with our knowledge. We try to do it our way. But the Bible says if we lack wisdom to ask God. So God, I know your will for my life. I know your will in this situation. I know your will, Father God, in this circumstances. But God, now I need your wisdom. And if you'll notice the context of this chapter, look at verse 2. It's talking about in a time of battle. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations. So when you're in the battle, Ask God for wisdom. You know the will in the situation. You know the will in the circumstances. You know the will in the battle. You know what God's will is. And now when you're in the heat of that battle, the word says, now ask God for his wisdom. Ask God for his wisdom in the midst of the battle. If you look at verse 13, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God can't be tempted with evil. 
people, I have attempt to see any man. In other words, God's not the source of the battle. God's not the source of the battle. The enemy is the source of the battle. <coughs> and God wants to give us wisdom to walk in victory. Hallelujah. Isn't that good news? You see, we can look at many of the classic examples in the Bible. We can look at, remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? When they were told that they, Nebuchadnezzar built the great big golden idol, they were told when they played the music to, to bow down and worship the golden idol. I mean, and if they didn't do that, they were going to be thrown in the fiery furnace, and they refused to do it. They were thrown in the fiery furnace, and crank it up seven times, make it worse. And then, you know, that, that Christ came into there and, and spared them. They came out of that without any burn, without any sinning or anything. We know about the, the Jericho when Israelites were born in the promised land and they came across this impregnable city, this great military fortress of the time, and then nobody could, could conquer that city. And God says, you know what? I want you to march around that city six times. And don't say a thing. Now on the seventh day, I want you to march around that city seven times. And I want you to shout, and when you shout, the walls are going to come down. And they did it. And you know what happened? The walls came down. Now you see, the interesting thing of that is, we understand God's will. But man's wisdom would have never came up with those answers. I mean, how many engineers would have taken a sit there and think, you know what, I know those walls are thick, and I know that army's great, but I think if we just march around that city six times and don't say anything. And on the seventh day, we march around it seven times. And then we shout, I think those walls will come down. In other words, a human intellect, a human mind, would not come up with that solution. But the Israelites came to the edge of the Red Sea, and they stood at the edge of the Red Sea, and then God says, do nothing, stand still, behold my salvation. And he parted the Red Sea, and they marched down the middle. The human mind never would have calculated or came to that solution. In other words, our wisdom is not going to come up with God's answer. I mean, human wisdom is not going to say, you know what, God's going to send his son, and he's going to die on the cross and, and shed his blood and pay the price for our salvation. He's going to be buried and resurrected on the third day. And we're going to put faith in that and be born again. And then we're going to enter into glory. Human wisdom wouldn't come up with that answer. You won't find anywhere in God's word where God's answer is something that can be produced by human wisdom. So if we're going to understand God's will, human wisdom will not accomplish God's will. It won't do it. That's why people can't do it. That's why you and I can't do it. We have to have God's wisdom. We have to have God's guidance and God's direction. And that's why it says here that, that when Paul was praying for the church of Colossus, praying for them to have knowledge of God's will, but not only, not only knowledge of God's will, but wisdom and spiritual understanding so that then they can be fruitful. We can know God's will in life and not be fruitful. I've known a lot of people who understood God's called me to do such and such, and they never did such and such because they always were trying to do it with human wisdom and human knowledge and human understanding and running time and time again into that law. Not seeking God's wisdom and God's knowledge and God's understanding. So you see, it's very important that we seek out God's wisdom. God's knowledge. It's not enough to just know God's will. We've got to have from God the wisdom, the directions, and the guidance on how to accomplish His will. One of the things, that, and you've heard me talk about this before, I'm, I'm thoroughly convinced that one of the things that is so frustrating to so many Christians is they're trying to accomplish God's will the world's way. And that's not going to work. Turn to James chapter 3. Hallelujah. We're winding down here. I'm going to keep you up too late. James chapter 3, verses 15. Through 17. Listen to this. There's more than one kind of wisdom in this world. James chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. 
I don't want that result. For where ending and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceful, gentle, and easy to be treated, full of mercy and good fruit, without partiality and without hypocrisy. You might say, Pastor, I understand all of that stuff, and that's really good. But how in the world would I know that it was God's wisdom? How could I possibly understand it, that you're talking about seeking God's wisdom? How could I possibly know that? Well, let us look at verse 17. The wisdom that is from above, and it tells us how to know that, is what? Pure, peaceful, gentle, and easy to be good treated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. It's pure. In other words, that means it's free from defilement. It's not contaminated from this world. It's holy. It's also peaceable. That means it produces peace in our heart. And I tell people that all the time. One of the number one ways you can tell when you're walking in line with God is a peace in your heart. And if there's not peace in your heart, then you're not walking in line with God. If the wisdom and the, the answer you got does not produce peace in your heart, then it's not God's wisdom. And that's one of the number one way you know it. The wisdom of this world doesn't put peace in your heart. It puts strife and contention and insecurity and doubts and fears and all kinds of stuff. But there's a wisdom that comes from above. And when that answer comes from above, instantly peace fills your heart. And you know, I've heard from God. I've heard from God. I've, I've got peace on the scene. I've got peace in this situation. And when the peace isn't there, we need to recognize that and think, I need to get with God and get some wisdom from above. And no matter what the situation, no matter what the circumstance, there's no situation or no circumstance that you can't have the peace of God in your heart. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego can be in a furnace and have the peace of God. Daniel can be in the lion's den and have the peace of God. Jesus can be in the garden getting ready to go to the cross and have the peace of God. Because they were walking in the wisdom of God. People can be in, 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 in the dangerous places in this world as missionaries and have the peace of God. And be in the nicest, safest place on this planet and not have the peace of God. Because they're not walking in the wisdom of God in one place and they are walking in the wisdom of God in another place. You see, if we're truly hearing from God, there's going to be peace in our heart. Gentle. That means fair and moderate and not insisting on the law reasonably and humanly. Just very simple. Gentle touch of God. And treated, ready to obey. The wisdom from heaven, the wisdom from above will put your heart in a place where you're willing to be obedient to God. If you're fighting against the will of God, that's not God's wisdom. It says mercy. God is merciful, isn't he? So his answer will always be merciful. God's answer is not harsh. God's answer is mercy. And any time that God's wisdom comes, you will find there's mercy in that situation. Every time. And that's again another way to recognize the wisdom of God. Say, well, God told me, I'm not supposed to be beating this person over the head. Probably not. <laughs> God spoke to me and told me to go to this person and extend mercy. You see the example, remember the lady who was caught in adultery? And, and the Pharisees had taken her and thrown her down on the, on the ground. Jesus, what are you going to do? The law says stone her to death. They didn't have the wisdom of God. They had an earthly wisdom. And they were going strictly by the letter of the law that says, Let's, this is our chance to get her good. And we know what Jesus went. He wrote the sand. We don't know what he wrote. He doesn't say what he wrote. I have my suspicions. I think maybe he wrote a lady's name. My thoughts. That the Pharisees said they went. They oh, we're going to get out of here. He knows. They left, and then Jesus said, Mama, where are your accusers? They're gone. Neither did I accuse you. Go and sin no more. 
The one thing you'll find in all of those situations where Jesus was put in those situations, he operated in the wisdom of God and he showed mercy. Why? Because the wisdom of God is merciful. And if we're not walking in mercy, we're not walking in the wisdom of God. Hallelujah. That shouting's there, ain't it? Without partiality. That's a good one, isn't it? Without indecision. You know that you know that you know that you know. Without hypocrisy. You're not pretending, you're not playing. You see, beloved, what I shared with you tonight, if you want to be a fruit bearing believer, and you want to be a fruit bearing Christian, and you want to walk in victory, the simple key know God's will and ask God for the wisdom on how to do it. And then the word of God says, comes the fruit. Comes the result. But a lot of times we get in trouble because we know God's will. And when we know God's will, we're trying to accomplish it with our worldly wisdom and our ways. And it never works. So look in your heart and ask yourself that question. I know God's will for my life, Pastor. But are you walking in his wisdom? And in his peace, in his mercy, in his grace, his compassion. That's how we know if the wisdom's from above or on this earth. Amen? Amen. What's that data come to the keyboard if we could? Let's just stand and worship God for a moment. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.